What's going on? Move the Mouse here back in City Skylines with another Info Views tutorial. When you're looking at how to troubleshoot or how to fix certain issues in your city, it's important to understand the information that you do have at your disposal. And a lot of that comes from just the Info Views panel. So that's what we're talking through today. When I sat down to record this one, I ended up recording and talking for about two hours straight, talking through all the different things in the info views. So there was way too much to break down into uh, just a single video. Keep working our way through the info views. And if you've got questions, let me know in the comments down below or better yet, check out the link to the discord. And there's a whole community of people over there, fans of cities, fans of the channel that can help you out regardless of what platform you might be on. So with that out of the way, let's jump right in. Looking at wind, this is only really important if you're using wind turbines, but there's a couple things to consider. Where can wind go? Well, if you live in a big valley like this, it doesn't get into the valley that well. You know, you've got to put your windmills um, kind of up in the taller spots. This one was purely decorative. This isn't very good from a power perspective. In fact, I don't think that's connecting power to anything. That is just there to provide decoration. Uh, as is this one, because I don't think there's anything running down the hill. Um, these will automatically turn with the direction of the wind. Um, and the darker the blue or greenish blue aqua marine, it's not, it's not a blue technically, right? Whatever color that is, uh, you'll notice that uh, the power output, the estimated production is listed down at the bottom. We can see eight megawatts of power right there when we're in one of those dark blue areas. And as soon as we start to move away from that, we get down to seven, six, might even get down to the point where, you know, if we're down here, it's zero. So we're, we're not doing any good by putting that thing there. It, it's surrounded by land. There's no wind coming through. So it's a horrible spot. If you want to have a wind farm, you know, look for a nice, nice spot like this where everywhere you go, it's, it's in the eights. Alternatively, you also have uh, this option, which is the advanced wind turbine. Uh, and this produces up to 20 if it has decent wind and water. Uh, in this case, the water doesn't have to be moving. It could be completely stagnant like this lake. It'd be totally fine. If I was to drop that over here, say, that would power those structures that we put under the water and you'll see those pop-ups that are complaining about electricity go away as those buildings become powered. Those were those water structures that I dropped in uh, earlier in the video when we were talking about that. Terrain height can be really useful for a couple different things. Um, here we can see what I've done to the bottom uh, of the lake. I actually carved out a, a flatter spot down there towards the bottom where I could drop uh, this. And, and I apparently overestimated the size that I needed quite a lot because we only have five structures and I've got space for about 50. Uh, but when we look at things in the normal view, we don't really see, you know, where the terrain height is. Uh, when we look at it with that info view on, now we can see, you know, where are the tallest parts? Where are the hills? Where do things break? Um, and and that can be really useful for kind of how to, to craft and build your neighborhoods. If you look at, you know, kind of where some of the slopes are, you don't want to generally run straight up a road, straight up a slope like this, like I did, um, because then you get really funny buildings like this, where you have these, you know, massive parts of the foundation that are sticking out. Um, and they don't quite sit right. They don't quite look right, but I, I might come up and clean those. Uh, but if you're going for something like that, let me jump over here. Sorry for the abrupt camera movement. But here we've got this, you know, this neighborhood that's kind of built on the hillside. And in fact, it's, it's called Sterling Bray for a reason. Um, but what we've got here, you know, is these, these very steep slopes from one street to the next because they're built along the terrain shifts, you know, we can see kind of where the terrain changes height. So you could build with it if you want things to be really smooth, or you can kind of build against it if you want to have more of a, a jagged look in uh, in an area. So totally up to you, but it can be really useful to see, you know, where those curves are. One of the nice things is on PC is you can select this tool with the road tool out and then say, build a road right along a particular height of a ridge. Uh, but unfortunately, when we uh, are in info views, there's no way to go to the road tool and keep that active. And when we have the road tool out, there's no way to uh, go into info views and look at things. So it's something nice that you can do on the PC is, is kind of draw roads that, that follow a ridgeline or right along a ridgeline. Uh, and they can be 
much more natural in kind of how they sit. Uh, I mean, you can get a look at it and a feel for it, but it's just a little easier uh, on PC in that regard. This next one is pretty straightforward, but it's important. It's noise pollution. And basically, the brighter the red, the worse the noise is in that area. And you can see I've got a couple of really bad offending areas. We've got our uh, industrial forestry area, our industrial farming, our prison power plant and recycling plant, our stadiums, our transport hub, and all that red you see on screen is commercial zones. And the higher the density, the more noise they make. So uh, low density commercial makes less noise than high density. And the unique buildings, which draw a lot of people into a small area, make tons and tons of noise. It's good to make sure that your noise pollution bubbles aren't expanding too much into your residential areas. Um, in this case, I actually, you know, I didn't zone these couple houses that were right behind the supermarket or hypermarket, whatever it's called, uh, just because I knew they'd be complaining, they wouldn't be happy. So you give a little bit of a buffer zone. And there's things you can do like plant trees or raise terrain. In the case of roads, anytime they're elevated, they do have kind of these Jersey barriers that come up along the side and they'll help reduce noise a little bit. Uh, but you also have options for, if we go to upgrade, uh, highway with an actual sound barrier. Oh, uh, that's a, that's a two lane highway. I did not mean to do that. Um, I won't be saving this city today, so I'm not even gonna worry about fixing that. But when you have a sound barrier, that reduces a lot of the noise um, that can potentially spread. Let's, let's actually take a look at that where over here on this highway. So if we look at our noise, you can see that, you know, there is quite a bubble uh, that extends on either side of the highway. If we go over here and upgrade to, let me make sure it's the right one, highway with sound barrier, it is. I'm gonna pause it and we're gonna upgrade, say this, this chunk of the highway right here, as much as we can. Let's do that. We'll go back into info views and see the noise as it was. And if we hit play, we're gonna notice that red shrink back quite a bit. Um, so you can use this if you're running highway through a city, uh, you know, having it kind of right up next to your apartments and stuff, you can pretty much eliminate a lot of the noise that happens there. Uh, certainly to the point where, you know, people might complain a little, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, you can see it almost went down to nothing and then it came back a little bit, but it's definitely uh, less pronounced than it was. As you can see there, there's a, a noticeable area. And if we back way out, I mean, we can see where that is. We can see where that impact is. So use noise barriers, use trees, use land in the way and, and raise elevation, sink your highways. That can help quite a bit too, right? So over here, um, I've got a bit of a sunken highway. It's, it's depressed into the ground just a little bit. Um, and it does help. It does help a, t a tiny little bit, right? Um, you know, it's not the best. Tunneled highways are great because they completely go underground and, and none of that sound can escape. You can see things like the windmills and power plants and lots of stuff's going to make noise. So try and keep it away from your residence more than anything else. That's the most important thing. When we look at the natural resources tab, this can be very useful for kind of understanding where our good farming areas are in yellow, where the good forestry areas are in green or in the blue and oil in black. Now, in this case, I'm kind of building a, a greenish city. It's not the, the greenest or it's the greenest on that I've ever built, uh, but it's not the greenest city overall. But we're, we're trying not to pollute. So we didn't take advantage of things like ore or oil. We did take advantage of farming on the right and forestry on the left. Now, for those to be effective, they do need that natural resource. Farms need to be sitting on good farmland to grow crops at any reasonable rate. Forestry needs to be in an area with trees. An interesting little trick is you can break out the landscaping brush. And if we come up here where we see this is really good, uh, uh, this is really good farmland up here, right? Uh, in yellow. And you can see the, the grass changes color just a little bit. Don't confuse that with the slightly darker uh, oil patch. I don't know if you can see these both in the same. The, the oil is just a little bit more yellow, a little bit darker right? It's, it's a little bit brighter over here where it's good farmland. Now, if we want to make a forestry area, technically we can make that anywhere with a tree brush. 
So we can just plant a bunch of trees down and notice how the, the grass turns much greener. That means that we've got a nice area for, for building a, a forestry area now, right? It's green. The thing to be aware of is that if I come back in here and delete this, it does not become good farmland again. That's gone forever. So on console, don't paint trees over your farmland until, in my case, you're sure where everything's gonna go. Um, and you can see I, you know, I, I built trees around it and kind of cut it out of the woods, uh, but I didn't want it to actually impact negatively uh, the farmland that was sitting there underneath. So you can always make trees. You can't make any of the other zones though. When it comes to ore and oil, unless you're playing with cheats, once you drain all the oil out of the land, you're done. You can't pull any more out. You can import it from off map to process it further down the line, but it's good to understand where your resources are, especially farming, because again, once you ruin it with something like trees, you can't ever get it back. So just keep that in mind uh, when you're planning out your build. Now, a lot of what's left is pretty quick, but part of that's because I haven't built some of this stuff or it doesn't apply to my map, but I'd like to cover it nonetheless. So if you look next, we have a breakout for different districts and this will just highlight, you know, kind of where your districts are. Uh, you might want to paint a district over specific areas to apply a specific policy to give a certain part of your town a name, an idea, a reminder, whatever it is. Um, but just keep in mind that you can pull up the districts here to get a quick glance at kind of what is defined where and see, you know, this is a leisure district. All the commercial in this district is going to be leisure focused. So we get things like nightclubs and comedy clubs and arcades and all sorts of stuff. And unfortunately we get some repeating buildings, even some kind of side by side, uh, but that's okay. It gives the uh, the part of the, the town a different function, a different focus. You can see the leisure area is a little bit redder than even this really busy street up here, which is all commercial. It's just generally a noisier area. So you're gonna to wanna to space that out a little bit more from uh, your other zones. But popping into districts can give you kind of a quick look at, at what all your districts are. In comparison, you can also break out the district tool and kind of see them in the overlay that way. Whatever your preference, keep an eye on things. And if you have uh, some particularly funny behavior happening, make sure that you know you don't have your districts overlapping where you didn't mean to. Um, you know, you can do things like Old Town, which prevent people from using these neighborhoods that you see on screen as a cut through. If this isn't your ultimate destination, I don't want you cutting through here. But if I paint that a little too far towards the end of the zone and prevent people from using this highway exit, that could totally throw things off. So check where your districts are and make sure they don't overlap intersections you didn't mean them to. In this case, this is just kind of sitting behind the scenes covering this neighborhood. And it's not actually affecting the street up above. Heating is one that I don't really have to worry about here. When the temperature does dip a little bit, maybe it dips into the 50s Fahrenheit, that's t-shirt weather for me in New England. It might be a little cold for some of you, depending on where you are in the world. But you don't generally have to worry about heating unless it's a map that is snowfall specific, and then you definitely have to worry about heating. In that case, there are different water pipes that you can upgrade to, and this is a water pipe with heating pipe, so it can carry hot water and people can use that instead of electricity. So, costs a lot more to put in though. So when we, so when you're making parallel routes of pipes with heating, before we went out $440 worth of pipe for parallel overlap. Uh, in this case, it's 2,200. Yes, it is. 2,200 will create that nice overlap where you're not wasting a ton of pipe and you can connect things that way. Uh, but that, again, only if you're worried about uh, heating a map, you should only have to worry about that in snowfall. All the same things apply though. You wanna make sure you have some sort of heating plant and that the pipes are connected and that they are not disconnected. Um, something like this, for example. So uh, just to show you real quick, pipe troubleshooting 101. If we go back to, what was it, 22? Let's say 22 right? And I break this pipe. Maybe it, it broke in a natural disaster, or maybe I just got sloppy with the bulldozer tool. You know, I might have the rest of my city, you know, perfectly covered all the way around. But since, you know, this say isn't connected to the rest of the grid, it can totally break things. So, so look for th little things like that. One time I made the mistake of doing this. Um, I had 
water pipes that I upgraded to heating pipes. And when I upgraded them, there was one little segment that I missed. So for example, like this, this is kind of exactly how I did it. So all this over here is connected to say the heating supply and all this is connected properly and it looks good, but there was one little piece of pipe in between that wasn't converted to heat. So it just wasn't carrying that, that heat. Once you upgraded it, it, it took me a little while to find. It. I could not figure out where it was. And it was like in the middle of the lake underwater. Just be careful when you're upgrading pipes or laying pipes that if you're going the heating route for snowfall, Make sure you've got those heating pipes everywhere that you want them. Now, there's a couple things that are particular to Natural Disasters DLC. If you like to play with them, that's totally fine. I, I find they are a big pain in the butt. At some point, I'll do a city where I'm actually preparing it for Natural Disasters. But in the meantime, uh, if you want to look through any of these things or if you're playing with them, there are ways you can look at multiple spots of coverage uh, very quickly. If we go to city services and natural disasters tab, we can drop in all sorts of things like shelters and disaster response units. And then there are things uh, like the radio masts and there's a small and a large version. We we'll unlock the large one later. Uh, this allows emergency broadcast to reach the citizens. The better the coverage is, the more likely citizens are to come to shelters when they're called. So you'll get a little warning depending on what you have on your map uh, that a disaster is coming and then you can issue a warning to tell everybody that, hey, you know, you need to go get to a shelter. Uh, now, in this case, it's not powered. That actually had really good coverage. Um, and this is affected by uh, where you put it. So if we put it up here on the mountain, it should be a lot better. If we put it down here in the valley, it's, you know, it's not going to see half those people. We can probably get away with just three. We do something like that, maybe. We can cover our city pretty well. And we can see where that coverage is. So, you know, pretty much everybody's going to hear that. Yeah, man, maybe these people. Are, I mean, when you think about it, a radio mast that tall, you should be able to get a radio station signal over here on the other side of the lake. But whatever. Uh, you've got to kind of space those out. So, again, the, the greener things are, the better. Don't waste your money by, by overlapping them too much. Um, and keep an eye out for this little icon, because if you're not powered, it, it's kind of deceiving because it, it looks like it's going to provide the signal, but I don't think that it does. Now, there's other things like tsunami and earthquake sensor detectors, and those, again, have kind of a, a similar area of effect. You can kind of drop these in anywhere. Uh, what's interesting about these is if you need to get power from, say, this building to over there, you can actually use the earthquake sensors to spread those because power will spread to the earthquake sensor, which will spread power to the next building down the line. And it's a little better than than putting in uh, power lines, if you ask me. I and mean, we already we already had power lines here, but if you've got this tiny little gap where, say, you know, uh, you know, this neighborhood over here or this farmland over here isn't powered, you could, you know, drop in a couple of these. They have uh, a forty three dollar a week upkeep cost, but it might be kind of cool uh, if you didn't want power lines running across your road. Let's let's look at this real quick. How many of these would it take? Uh, let's see. Can we go either side of the road? And then let's put one on, I don't know, this side of the road. Let's take a quick look at the power bubbles. This is a total, total diversion and waste of time. Uh, but you could do that. You could do that as kind of a trick if you wanted to kind of hide, uh, hide some of these. Uh, that's the wrong spot. If you wanted to hide some of these in the woods, you could use that to cascade power down the line. I think that will do the trick. Again, I'm not saving this, but you know, does that look better than than power lines running through your woods? Maybe, you know, if you carefully planted some trees around it, you might be able to hide them a little bit better. Right? Do something like that. You can barely see them now, right? So just a just a trick. A diversion, a squirrel moment. Let's get back to the content. <laughs> So earthquake detection, we dropped in a couple of those earthquake detectors, tsunami detection, all those things, right? The, the more sensors you have, the, the more well prepared you are as a mayor, you still need to flip the switch and actually evacuate people. Something that goes along with that is the escape routes, but I, I'm not really gonna dive into this one. Um, it's basically high or low in terms of coverage. And again, the 
ability for the citizens to get to shelters. So make those accessible. If you're playing with natural disasters, if you're not, you don't have to worry about all this. Now, when disasters happen, you have this destruction mechanic as well, and you can destroy roads, power lines, cut holes in the earth, all sorts of stuff. There's a building called the Disaster Response Unit. So if you place that on your map, and let's say a building collapses, it'll actually send out helicopters to search that building and allow you to rebuild it. Otherwise, all you can really do is bulldoze the rubble and start from scratch. So that could be very expensive uh, to rebuild certain buildings or park buildings, whatever it might be. Having a disaster response unit is pretty important if you have natural disasters turned on. So definitely consider that. And you can kind of see the uh, the destruction that is happening in your city. Uh, in fact, here, there we go. Now that we see that little icon over here, if we click on this building for a minute, you'll see that the building is ready for rebuilding because it's been searched. So all I have to do is hit the A button and it'll rebuild that building versus having to bulldoze it and, and pay the full price to put that building back in. Uh, so definitely something that is worth having again if you have natural disasters turned on. Now, I actually did a video as part of the, the Park Life series uh, on the City Skylines official channel. I'll leave a link to that in the description down below. It's probably the best video that I have that I can recommend on the topic. But, you know, tourism is a really interesting mechanic for bringing people into your city that don't live there, right? Tourists come in to see things, to, to be tourists. Um, and that can be affected by what there is to see in your city, the overall attractiveness, the more citizens that you're bringing from off map, the more tourism revenue you're making for things that you don't have to support as much from an infrastructure standpoint. So tourism can be really useful. They wanna come see uh, leisure and nightlife spots. They wanna see unique buildings. They of course wanna come hit up things like the casinos and the malls. So give them a way to get to your city like train lines and airports. Give them ways to get around like mass transit and you'll be able to reap the benefits of having uh, more people come into your city, spend tax revenue, and then leaving. And ultimately, you don't have to support them for things like education and healthcare. They'll just come and spend money and go, and that's perfect. Now, I have not set up any tours, but you can do things like walking tours, bus tours, and balloon tours. Um, and you can put those kind of around areas where there's things of interest, right? Where would people want to see things? Well, you can see that on the map when you look at the tours, the things that are in purple, are those things that are really cool and appealing to go see. And they're the unique buildings, the monuments, the casinos, the cathedrals, all sorts of things like that. And you can see um, that areas like commercial strips are one, a good place to put some of those things because they make noise and commercial strips are already noisy. But if you have a bunch of them kind of spread out just enough in a long row, you can do things like walking tours and bus tours and encourage more tourists to come into your city, spend some money, see the sites, and then get out. Keep in mind with things like walking tours, there is too far. So if you make a walking tour that goes around your entire city for 20 miles, nobody's going to take it because they get on the route and they're going to go the entire route. So make a walking tour that maybe runs, you know, up and down this stretch of commercial that you see here on screen, but don't have them walking all the way across the lake. Be nice to them uh, because they won't be nice to you. They won't, they won't take the tour if it's too far. So keep that in mind. There is a sweet spot. Experiment around and see how many people are visiting. I have none in my city. Maybe it's something that I need to work on. Park maintenance works very similar to road maintenance in that there are buildings, they have a certain area of coverage, and you can actually see here what park maintenance would affect. It would affect all my park objects, which I've got kind of mixed in to uh, a commercial block, right? Rather than have this act as just a park um, or just a commercial block, I've got it kind of acting as both. So there are footpaths and objects that people can use to cut through. And of course, when they cut through, every time they go through one of those gates, they're paying for the privilege going into the park so it's kind of nice we're using it as a way to uh, make the area a little bit more beautiful a little bit more land value give pedestrians a way to cut through neighborhoods which reduces traffic and we're making money off of it at the same time and by raising the land value and giving entertainment we're making more tax revenue parks are awesome get the park life dlc if you don't have it it's a really cool way to make money for your city now on the industries area tab, of course, if you have that DLC, you can inspect a little bit more uh, information about your forestry, 
farming ore and oil. If I had them, I would show you, but you can also do an industry area overview and you can see the different types. You can sort by name, see the workers and the levels that they're at. Um, and if you click on one of those, it'll actually bring you to the forestry area. In this case, we can go over to info views and you know do a deeper inspection of that education levels and employment and all those sorts of things. The industry area overview just gives us a quick way. If we have multiple industries in an area to be able to look at that. Now up next and actually just immediately after that is two things that I am not using, but there are post office and fishing. Uh, I'm just not taking advantage of either of those things. Post offices can technically give you some happiness, but they also introduce traffic and I'm all set with that. So um, email it is for now, but if you have post offices, you can see kind of where the efficiency is, where the coverage is. You have, you know, your traditional post office and then a distribution center, which handles uh, you know, greater distro to the outside world. Uh, again, they add traffic for a tiny little bit of happiness boost. I'm just not using them. Last on our info views is fishing and fishing. There's four different types of fish, anchovy, salmon, shellfish, and tuna. And depending on the depth of the water and the flow of the water, you might get different fish here in our lake. We've got two different depths. So we can see we have anchovies in green, shellfish in yellow the deeper waters where the shellfish are going to be. And because the water is not flowing, that's the types of fish that we get. If we look over here at the river where the water flow is much faster, we can actually get tuna in the really deep water, which apparently tuna love to swim around in the sewage output. And then where the water is a little bit uh, more shallow, we can see we've got uh, salmon. So you can use that as a way to kind of see where the best fishing spots are. Um, and you can do just generic fishing and, and send a route through an area, but you can also do fishing piers that are specific um, and they'll be better at pulling in fish of a certain type. So keep that in mind. But with that out of the way, this was a very long video. Um, it took me about, it's about two hours of record time. So I hope I edited this down to something that's useful and informative. And hopefully you found something you were looking for today. Hopefully you learned something good. I do lots of content on my channel, but definitely lots of cities. So if you enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more and considering the bell to get notifications for updates and other how to's tutorials and let's plays that I've got going on. I've got a let's play going on right now. Season 10. If you want to check out kind of how I built this city step by step, check the link down in the description for that. If you'd like to support the channel, lots of ways you can do that as well as if you're stuck and you've got questions, Consider joining the Discord. It's an awesome group of people over there. We play on all different types of platforms. So regardless of what you're on, and if you've got a question, we probably run into it over there. It's a really helpful group and it's a lot easier uh, to get a response than it is for me trying to keep up with all the comments on YouTube. So if you've got a question, link to the Discord in the comments down below. Links to that and lots of other things, like all the ways to support the channel are down there too. Again, hopefully you enjoyed Hopefully you picked up some tips and tricks and got some ideas on how to troubleshoot and how to fix the problems that are happening in your city. Like I said, there's no way that I can cover everything um, in a video this long, which is ridiculous. So I just can't cover everything in one video. So chances are you'll have questions, ask in the comments, join the discord until the next one though, this is move the mouse signing off.